The number one place for people to listen to the radio is in the car. Lifestyles have changed. People aren't in their cars as much. The number two place is at work. People aren't at their offices as much. So what happens when nobody's on the road and nobody's at work? In April, we saw the typical radio station lose about 50 to 70% of its revenue. That's massive. A lot of people listen to the radio in their cars, but no one is driving. Still others love to listen at work, but everyone's working at home. Now what happens? Following social distancing, we're on location in Annapolis, Maryland with Charlie Sislin, who is a partner at RDI, Research Director Incorporated, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thank you for having me. Nielsen publishes on a regular basis the amount of people who listen to the radio and then stations and advertisers use that to place their content. Your job is to interpret it. What trends are you seeing these days? Well, lifestyles have changed drastically since the uh, onset of COVID-19. Now, the data in major markets, top 45 markets in the US, let's say, comes out every 28 days. And the previous report, which was called March, Half the report was before the government shutdown or before the shutdown, and half was after it. So that was a fairly unusual report. The latest report that is just being released this week, all 28 days were during the government shutdown. And we saw a drastic change in how people listen to radio by both extent, where, and when. And it is a true reflection that lifestyles have changed. People aren't in their cars as much. People aren't at their offices as much. So being less mobile, the out-of-home listening has, has dropped off, but there have been some increases at at-home listening. Now, when you say it's dropped off, is it a 10% decline, a 30% decline, or even worse? Well, it, it depends on what your base is. If we look at the past 12 books before the, that March report, because that March report's half and half, you're usually seeing somewhere around a total 30% drop in radio listening, uh, or at least how Nielsen measures it. And most of that drop is, or more significant is the drop in the younger demos, the 18 to 34 and 18 to 49 have seen a more significant decline in their listening. Most of that decline, if not in some markets, all of that decline has been from away from home listening. So what happens if in the younger demographics, people just live stream at home and still want to listen to their favorite radio station? Well, that's a great question. And that gets into how the survey is done. The survey is done in these major markets by people carrying a device called a PPM. And that device picks up whatever radio station you're listening to. If in the line is, if your ears can hear it, the meter can hear it. And it, it time stamps it so it knows what you were listening to and when you were listening. For all terrestrial radio stations, they have an encoder on their signal. Not all streamed radio stations have an encoder. Most do, but some don't. If they don't have that encoder at their, di at their digital platform, the listening is occurring, but the meter's not picking it up. So it is losing some other, that listening. The other part of listening that's lost and has been ever since the Nielsen went to the system is headphones, now earbuds. Again, the meter has to hear that device or the device has to hear the signal. And if you're wearing earbuds, it just doesn't pick it up. So the personal people meters, the PPMs, are not Correct. necessarily picking up what they should. What does that mean to radio station ownership, management, and then advertisers? If broadcasters have two ways of taking care of their stream, one is called TLR. That stands for Total Line Reporting. And what that means is whatever comes out of your stream or whatever comes over the airways through your tower is identical to what comes through your stream, including the commercial messages. In that case, Nielsen puts the two numbers together and, that, and you can't separate them because the ads are the same on both. However, many radio stations do what they call split their signal. The commercial that you hear over the antenna or in the regular broadcast is a different commercial than you hear on the stream. In that case, Nielsen does not combine them. But what broadcasters do is they sell the digital differently. They don't use, typically don't use the Nielsen data to sell their currency. 
They're selling it on gross impressions. Just how we can deliver this ad 10,000 times in Boston. And because it's all server based, they know that they've delivered that commercial 10,000 times. So it's more of a uh, actual delivery than using the Nielsen for negotiating of a rate. Now, I know that your company has clients all over the United States and also in Canada. What are you primarily hearing from your clients these days? Are they sucking up the last 28 days or are they already making future business planning changes? Let's remember, and I, I did a talk yesterday, that this collapse, and I'll use that term, happened in about 36 hours. And I tell radio, I say the line that radio station salespeople had to go through the first five parts of grieving in about 36 hours, which is, you know, denial, anger, whatever the rest are. They had 36 hours. Now, what we're talking about radio listening, but I need to stress that sales also plummeted because when restaurants close, they're not advertising. Sure. When concerts and sporting events aren't happening, they're not advertising. In April, we saw the typical radio station lose about 50 to 70% of its revenue. That's massive. Cut in half or more. Uh, May is kind of summer, summer, Everyone's down, but in the summer, not as bad, but we're still hearing 30 to 50% down. So salespeople have had to adapt to how they're handling this change. Now, our hope is as markets open up, not only will the ad revenue come back, but people will be commuting again. People will be in their offices again. People will be out shopping again. And at that time, their radio listening will be back to normal levels. What keeps you up at night about the future of your own company? What keeps me up at night is the idea that there are so many different ways for people to advertise now. I mean, when I started in this business, it was television, it was broadcast television, radio, billboards, and uh, newspaper. Well, now, you know, radio sales or media sales, like everything else, is supply and demand. It's supply and demand. Well, we now have an unlimited amount of advertising supply. We will never run out of advertising supply because of digital. Google is never going to turn somebody away and say, I don't have any ad space. Therefore, the price of, that radio stations charge is a fraction or could become a fraction. So radio stations have to, can't sell as a commodity, same way television can't sell as a commodity, Newspapers are trying to make the transition over to digital, but having a very having a very easy time of transferring the readership to digital, but having a very difficult time of transferring the revenue to digital. And that's my fear for radio. We can do a great job of pushing people from the terrestrial signal to the smart speaker, but we better know how to monetize that in a way that we can continue to be a profitable business. Charlie, thank you. Thank you. Charlie Sislin, partner at Research Director Incorporated out of Annapolis, Maryland. Are you a problem solver? Do you see the big picture and the small details? Want to turn big data into big decisions? Take AI to the boardroom. Translate rocket science into the science of business. Build your career at digital speed with a master of science in business analytics. Be ready for careers like analytics consultant, data science, analytics strategy, data translator, BI analyst, technical business analyst. 10 months and you're in business analytics. You can't pay your employees or your rent. How is your landlord going to help you? We're on location three blocks from the White House with Michael Goldman, the president of MGA Incorporated, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks for having me, Greg. You are a tenant oriented real estate brokerage. What are you telling your tenants these days to do about their landlords? It's an unbelievably tough time uh, because for the first time ever, um, the, the, the tenants can't get access to their space, right? They are not using the space. So I think the first thing is, um, one, let's review the lease. Uh, let's get counsel on board. And then let's also just have a conversation with the landlords. We need to pay rent. Most of these leases uh, are not taking away the burden of paying rent uh, from the tenant's perspective. And so we need to, one, pay rent, and then, two, initiate and engage in a conversation with the landlords. Does either a tenant's insurance policy or a landlord's insurance policy provide some buffer right now? 
I think going into this, that was the hope. I think what folks have found, um, and it's been difficult to find this out, is that from the business interruption side of things, uh, from the clauses such as uh, a force majeure clause in the lease, th these leases really have not taken away um, that that tenant's burden of paying rent. And the, the, the problem that uh, that most of these tenants are seeing is that they can't they can't run their business normally. And so I, I think when you're engaging in those conversations with landlords, landlords. Landlords want to do right by the tenants. I don't think it's a landlord against tenant or tenant against landlord type of environment. Um, and so when we engage in those conversations, I think landlords are doing what they can to, to work with their tenants. But what would you counsel your own clients if their landlord tells them, hey, I still need to pay real estate taxes, my mortgage, and property upkeep and maintenance. I'm trying to be supportive, but if nobody pays rent, everybody's going to go out of business. I, I think what we're finding is some of these landlords are saying, listen, I, I will give a rent holiday. I will, um, you know, cut, cut rent in half for a period of time, maybe extend the lease, do something along those lines. I think the best thing and the good landlords, which most of them are uh, in these major markets, they want their tenants in business. If they don't want to come back from, from, from this work from home period of time and, and have you know, doors boarded up or, or offices not occupied. And so I think that, that uh, again, what I would tell them is what, engage in a, in a discussion. Be transparent with your landlord. This is not the time to, to, to hide information. It's the time to share information and have a, have a working conversation with them. And we're a part of those discussions. You're in the D.C. metro area, three blocks from the White House. Any regional differences you're seeing between cities? I think it's a really good uh, question. Histor and, and, and that I think it's important to look backwards. And so if you think about our market um, compared to other major markets around the country, and you look in the most difficult times, so take the 08, you know, the Great Recession, when we came out of that, Washington was outperforming other major markets. And I think that's a uh, uh, in large part due to our client base, our tenant base, the nonprofit, the trade association world um, that stabilizes our market in comparison to, you know, like a tech hub or some, something along those lines. Um, so I think that our market historically has outperformed uh, other major markets um, in downtimes. It's a much more stable, stable market. And landlords know that. And so that's another reason why I think landlords are willing to say, I know this group is going to be around three years, five years, seven years from now. When do you think it's going to get better for everybody? You know, the most important thing is, is, obviously, is obviously everyone's health and, and well-being. I think people want to get back to work. I think there was a sense of panic amongst the executives that I spoke to maybe four weeks ago. What is this going to be? How are we going to adapt? Um, and all of a sudden, people have embraced it. I think that organizations have been unbelievably strong. Uh, our team has been unbelievably strong in embracing the adversity and finding ways to push through. But I think now all of a sudden, and may maybe it's just how many more of those lunches can I eat at my own dining room table, uh, people want to get back to work. Looking through your website, a lot of members of your team are listed as managing directors. Are those considered to be employees or managing directors? And if so, how is the PPP legislation going to help you keep MGA Incorporated afloat? For our firm, we, we actually have gone through the, the PPP uh, program. We have a mixture of um, both W-2 and 1099 uh, folks. Um, many of the brokers are 1099, but we're also structured uh, differently than some other commercial real estate advisory firms. In that way, we've gone through the PPP program. We have our SBA number. We are waiting for the funding, but but um, but not counting on it. I, I think that, um, and we could go on for for hours about what we count on. But um, we've built a company very different than our competitors, and so I think what we rely on is each other more than any type of financial backing from the government. What what I rely on, and I take a lot of pride in this, is my job every day throughout this has been to wake up. And not only work with my clients, but also work with our brokers within our firm and make sure that, that they're operating at max productivity um, during, during this period of time. Michael, thank you. Thanks, Greg. Really appreciate it. Michael Goldman, the president of MGA Incorporated in the D.C. metro area.
How can you do your part to kill COVID-19? We're joined by Sandy Poza and Melissa Lush, co-founders of Force of Nature, and welcome to the Language of Business. Melissa, you are co-founder and chief marketing officer. How do you exactly kill COVID-19? I'm sure a lot of people would want to be a part of that immediately. Well, it's maybe a little bit hard to believe, but we make a little appliance that changes salt, water, and vinegar into a disinfectant as effective as bleach, so it kills 99.9% .9 of germs, as well as the novel coronavirus, and it's completely non-toxic. So you make it on your own countertop. You don't have to worry about going into a store and seeing bare shelves with no disinfectant and sanitizer. You can make it as you need it. It replaces all of your other cleaners and it's so gentle you can spray it on a baby's toy and hand it right back to your baby without worrying about rinsing it, wiping it down, etc. Why do you then need the appliance as opposed to the other products where you basically just point and spray? Well, it's really interesting. The existing products out there have a lot of ingredients in them that signal that the product's working. So for example, maybe it's dyed a color, it looks blue or pink or lavender, and that's really just a perception driver. They also have ingredients like surfactants that are create suds that give you the perception that a cleaner is working, or um, things like Fragrance. Fragrance is a huge signal that a cleaning product is working, but at the end of the day, none of these things are really doing anything from an efficacy standpoint. Um, and you look at the shelf, the cleaning shelf in a store, and it's tons of different products for different types of cleaning jobs and different cleaning surfaces. So the beautiful thing about Force of Nature is that you only need this one product and it will work on glass, on rugs, disinfects all your bathroom services, etc. So it's we've done third party independent lab testing and our product is as effective as the top cleaning brands, except it has no toxic chemicals. So that's and another sort of paradigm we're breaking. Sandy, you are co-founder and also CEO. How are you distributing this product these days? So today we uh, distribute in only two places, one on our own site, uh, forceofnatureclean.com, and secondly on Amazon. Those are the only two places we sell um, today. What advantage, Sandy, do you have being, if you will, a second mover? You're not Clorox, you weren't there from the beginning, but to Melissa's point, you're adding a lot of value even as a later entrant. The real advantage is our business model is completely different than the uh, big, large chemical companies that sell mainly through grocery stores. Um, and that advantage comes, comes in the nature of our product and, how, and the non-toxic um, nature of it. So our benefit is all around um, a healthy perception in, uh, at homes. So we're all about making homes more safe and healthy, which our competitors, uh, because of the nature of the ingredients that they have in their products, can't do. Melissa, moving forward, do you anticipate introducing different types of products using the same technology? Yeah, this has a lot of applications. If you think about all of the different um, issues that bacteria causes or bac bacteria or fungus is another one. Um, it, these are the root of all sorts of different issues in our lives. So even if you if you start with um, bacteria, for example, there it causes skin problems um, in adults, in babies. You know there are um, diaper rashes, acne. You know all sorts of different things. So if you just start from the premise of like of how useful is something that can kill bacteria practically every inch of beings in your home and services in your home are impacted. So you can, you can define this technology in a very, very broad way and think of lots of different applications for it. I mean, for us near term, we're working on things like different sized units. So right now, you know, I mentioned it was, it's the size of a wine bottle, um, which is perfect for your regular household. 
although we have had a lot of um, people ask for larger sizes. They, they're going through so much, particularly right now, that um, they really want a larger size. So we're looking at things like um, different sizes, different things that you can use with it, et cetera. So there are, the technology really presents us with a lot of um, interesting angles we could go into. Sandy, as CEO of the company, what keeps you up at night about Force of Nature's future? I think that the, um, the world has changed in such a dramatic way. Um, and it's very clear that behaviors around cleaning and disinfecting are never going to be the same. And, you know, and for us, that's an advantage. Today, I think the thing that makes me um, ex both excited and nervous at the same time is the fact that we have to make such dramatic changes to keep up with the growth. So that means b bigger and better partners. It means uh, more capital to grow the business. So we have an advantage because we're one of the few, if only product of our, of our kind on the market today. But um, we have to grow really fast right now because of the nature of what the world is. And I think we should be attempting to do it on a global basis, actually. So to take a small company and try to become a, a global player quickly um, re requires um, more capital, uh, a broader management team. Um, and if we don't do that, someone's going to beat us to market. Sandy Poza, co-founder and CEO. Melissa Lush, co-founder and chief marketing officer. Thank you very much today for joining us both on the show. Big choices after college, right? Grad school, maybe? Soar from your undergraduate major to a great career in business. Biomedical engineer to healthcare analyst. Health science to clinical systems analyst. Mechanical engineer to solutions engineer. Before you know it, you can have a master's degree in management studies. Nine months and you're in business. You're in the job placement business and business is booming. Plus, you've won several awards from incubators and accelerators. But then something comes along, something unanticipated called COVID-19, and it completely derails your entire business plan. What do you do next? We're on location with Tony Leo, co-founder of JobGet, and welcome to the Language of Business. Thanks for having us here, Greg. Uh, it's a pleasure to reconnect again. How have you changed your marketing approach to attract either prospective employers or prospective employees? Yeah, I would say that, I mean, we really echo with a lot of our clients and we have since launched um, something called the Instant Placement Initiative. So what that is, is we're offering $5,000 of free job posting credits to any essential businesses that are looking to hire during these difficult times um, to make it easy for them and to make sure that money is not a factor for them when it comes to a necessary hiring decision. And that was well appreciated by the community that needs the product the most. And they've been kind of using that to record, recruit more people on board. Um, at the same time, we're also, the initiative also helps a lot of displaced job seekers where if they need to find a new job or if they need to um, get a new gig, they can use our platform and we can almost instantly place them into interviews with different local organizations that need help. Thank you so much for your efforts. My next question is, Internally, when it comes to your own expenses, have you had to rejigger those or reduce them, or have those pretty much taken care of themselves? It's a great question. I mean, we've been trying our best to keep all our staff on board, and so far we have succeeded in doing so. Um, our team remains very motivated because we are driven by the mission to kind of help the local communities. So we are really just shifting our focus to where we are helping. So, for example, if we used to focus purely on um, across the spectrum on small businesses, big corporations, big box retailers, essential businesses. Now we would have the team shift on those essential businesses that need more help in hiring. So everyone's still keeping busy. Um, at the same time, we're also reaching out to organizations that are helping displace workers. Um, so there's plenty to do across the team and all our staff have great morale and good team efforts. And uh, we're seeing pretty, uh, pretty good activity across the board. Let's assume that relatively soon things revert to normal. Has what's happened to you in the past 15 or 30 days going to have any permanent impact on how you run the company moving forward? The last 30 days, really, there's been a huge disruption in the marketplace. And given any disruption, 
we'll see a huge ramp up in demand af after this current crisis is over. So I would say that our efforts over the last you know, couple of weeks and days have well prepared us to meet those demands once this disruption is over. But you're not going to change the way you do things just because of what happened in the last 30 days. Yeah, more or less, I think we would remain focused on the businesses that do need help. Um, but the things that we do more or less remains the same. Correct. And what advice would you have for employers looking to hire people or people who are looking to get their old jobs back or a new job? Yeah, our advice is that um, still stay on target. I mean, if you are looking to hire, there's still plenty of high quality candidates that are looking for great jobs. And for the people that are looking for jobs, you know, think outside the box in the sense that um, if your previous industry has been impacted, there are a lot of great essential businesses that are looking for great people um, in many places across all you know, horizontal and vertical industries. So definitely keep looking and don't give up. What is the single biggest thing you're worried about right now? The single biggest thing that I'm worried right now is that the current crisis lasts you know, longer rather than sooner. So, um, so if this thing drags out to months on end, then there could be a ripple effect in terms of just an overall recession. Right now, we're already seeing a lot of the, not only on the restaurant or retail side, but across the board in technology companies and restaurant related staffing companies, there's been huge layoffs. And if this crisis carry on longer than a few months, that recession is going to hit very imminently. And that's going to have a lingering effect for the years to come. So that's, you know, knock on wood that this, this crisis is over sooner rather than later. Tony, have you had to change your pricing for the companies you work with? Are they looking to cut their expenses in that area? Yeah, yeah, definitely. They have cut back on a lot of their spending. So what we're doing is part of our initiative, we're offering free credits. So during this time period uh, where they're able to still do postings without spending money. Tony, thank you very much. Thanks for having us. Tony Leo, the co-founder and CEO of JobGet. Support for the language of business is from Boston University Questrom School of Business. We're also available as a podcast on Spotify, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you get podcasts. Thanks for watching.